institution. And another one that I missed putting in there, that last one would be administrators. Ryan, would you mind? The last one. Sorry, I was stepping uh, myself. So. <laughs> okay, no, no I'll, I'll do it after. Um, students, um, uh, what will the ambassadors do? Stories, experience, and outcomes. Uh, both novice students and experience have completed courses or certificates, include the stories in news, newspapers, uh, because we need the student lens. And, and also, like students who, who use OERU courses in their own traditional program, there may be students who actually are traditional students, but then also uh, uh, take uh, OERU courses as well. Um, faculty as developers, uh, thinking about open boundary courses and how they can build networks outside of the classroom. Faculty as researchers as well, doing design-based researches. Um, uh, for, for instance, how they design courses in the OERU environments. And also uh, giving to be able to produce testimonials and how beneficial their learning was within the OERU for their face-to-face -face courses. New pedagogical understandings for discipline-based research. How it helps them build communities and networks, the types of pedagogical research within the discipline. Sorry, a little bit of there. And the benefits of adoption of OER, OERs for under advantaged students. Testimonials, instructional designers, uh, teaching and learning staff could contribute how they overcame course challenges, what new open pedagogies, tools and techniques they use, what new communities they built. I know in my own experience, our design teams have built all kinds of new networks and communities. Uh, IDs and faculty developers together, um, how they work together and how they enlarge their practice of developing and learning by using open education resources and, and practices. Administrators raising more awareness in their own institutions and elsewhere. What actions does it take? Well, first of all, finish our, our minimum viable product and get testimonies and stories as outlined above from those people who engaged in, in, in these processes. Obtaining data and evidence to start uh, presenting uh, this these stories and, and artifacts and so on. Uh, and the analytics piece obviously is going to be important for that, so we've actually got some evidence-based um, uh, um, narratives. Obtaining, uh, uh, promoting research, conference, publication, presentation opportunities. I know a lot of people here who have taken their experiences here, written papers, been to conferences, done presentations. When we say presentations, it could be conferences or other scholarly uh, uh, gatherings. Could also be to our own senates and, and uh, other groupings within our institutions. Whatever resources we develop doing this way, rather than just having it all done centrally, we could have, I hate to use the word repository because it seems like repositories are where things go to die and get lost and never appear again, <laughs> and, and absorb large amounts of money while we're doing that. Um, so, but somehow within within our, our environment, our digital environment, a place where we can share the, the, uh, uh, the learnings that we've had, the strategies that we've used. Uh, and make sure that they're all licensed appropriately, and also, you know, develop, you know, uh, um, within that uh, area also wherever we're blogging to these kinds of things and, and sending Twitter feeds to have those uh, available. Decision recommendations, um, institutional representative, representatives build these ideas into their institutional action plans, and have uh, again a common OU area to share ideas or put our stories back in. Of, the, of, the, of all the things that we're doing, so we're doing papers, we're doing presentations, doing those kinds of things, um, uh, put them in there. And I know we've got, uh, Rory, you've got the research cloud, right? Uh, that, uh, there, there are some areas that are collecting this kind of data, and Rob, you know, the, your research hub. I'm sure there's other areas where we could also be promoting uh, the wider, um, feeding this stuff into the wider education research community. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Any questions for group one? <laughs> All right, moving on then. Group two uh, was having a look at the, uh, the whole organizational and structural development uh, side of things, and I'm not sure how, how, how it was recorded. Sorry, we had some trouble, but uh, we, so, we will get it up there. We've got a word. Okay, and, and that translates it. If you can just um, <laughs> promise to send that document to me <laughs> and put pressure from Becca until it's done. Uh, that's just, I, I'll get it into the wiki quickly. It's yes. quick and easy, but you just email me the document. We'll do it. Um, so just go through it rapid. I've just rearranged. 
colleagues in Zoo's short term, medium, and long term, uh, we had quite a wide ranging discussion. We focused almost exclusively on staff development. I'll talk quite quickly. Um, short term, um, we need to focus on academic staff, how to make use of OER, use the tools, the systems, the pedagogy, pedagogy um, and some really simple what next. So if the staff are interested, where do they go next? And that includes um, use of tools, etc. but also how to go about navigating your internal system. So if someone comes to me and says, I want to do some OER within, you, within UHI, who do you go and see? What's the systems? Um, administrative staff. So they need to be aware of what happens when someone goes from uh, outside the institution to inside the institution, um, how, how that changes. Um, Camtasia, I know I can't say that word, but capture style sessions to those available tools. So we'll find an open source version of that. Um, so those are short term wins. We're not got medium term things around legal requirements, copyright staff need to be aware of those. Um, we think there's materials already available. We could probably pull those from what already exist to, to create those materials. Um, an interesting concept of staff development for people outside universities, etc. Intermediaries such as advocates, third sector organisations, NGOs who might be advocating students taking this kind of approach. Um, what else? We thought about the idea of some way of accrediting staff with their ability to engage with or make use of open sources. So we thought about maybe open badges or possibly making use of the HA fellowships, but some way of recognising people for what they can do. And we did talk about in the longer term how if you want people to engage in this way, you need to build that into um, employment, to reward, to promotion structures within the organisation. Otherwise, it's something they're doing in addition to their day job, and that really puts it at risk. Um, we had an interesting discussion around what is a lecturer, and this is the sort of medium to long term about thinking what people's roles are. Are we really talking about lecturers in this context? We're talking about a different kind of role there, and that whole related to staff that are around the skill sets of developing online courses. Um, a move from what am I going to do every 10 minutes hour to what the students do every 10 minutes or doing now. So it's a change in that mindset. And then finally, the long term, really look at that career structure. We talked about um, uh, potentially having people at induction, new students of staff, this being part of what they do, just built in from the, the beginning that developing digital literary and staff and students is something inculcated in every new member of staff. As I say, these are long-term projects. Um, and this whole idea of rethinking of um, not invented here to proudly borrow from there, that kind of mindset is really important. Is there anything else in the cell? Just, well, right at the beginning of our time together, we had a sort of brief discussion about what staff were we talking about. You know, are they the staff within the institution or just people from all over? Yeah. And even within the institution, are we only talking about academic staff? Are we talking about instructional designers, administrators, people who train academic staff and work with academic staff? It's it, because the answers to these questions can depend on which audience we're talking about. And in the future, who's going to be developing courses for OERU? Is it the students themselves? Who, are we going to be crowdsourcing the development of these courses? And if so, how do we manage quality and whatnot? So, <laughs> so you try to focus on staff development, you come up with well, yes. staff development for what purpose? A very rich discussions and Please make sure that I get that document so I can <laughs> record it in, uh, in the meeting reports and figure out the ways forward then. Okay, so um, a group three was uh, our group where we proceeded with the discussion on thinking about our existing organization and structures. And um, we got uh, good reflections and feedback from you know, folk who are active on work, you know, working groups. And, Feedback from folk who are kind of new to the area, or you who haven't necessarily been involved with any of the working groups. And I think uh, a sort of summary realization of you know why this is important was possibly the most important message. And it, it, this is really about rationalization. You know, rationalizing the number of groups to the core groups that we need in order to do what we are doing to do it well. 
but there was a lot of discussion around uh, various aspects of our organizational structures. Um, and I've attempted because some of these points were made within the context of particular working groups. And I've been trying to generalize, and a lot of the discussion centered around the notion of the ac academic board without going into you know, too much detail of their development. But the question on, you know, who, who are the best people to serve on each of these, you know, working groups? And, you know, how do we recruit them? We need to uh, improve familiarity amongst OERU partners uh, about our OERU structures and how they work, at least for those folks that are directly engaged with the OERU. We noted that to date uh, our, our work on credit transfer has largely been an abstract discussion uh, because you know we haven't had the raft of courses to actually push through and we suspect that you know, the nature of the discussion is going to change once we start pushing these courses through. Um, again, uh, good points made around improving communication structure, uh, communication structures and how we actually execute the communication within the network. I mean, the point was made that you need to be a lot clearer about the action items you know, when these communications go out. And staff aren't entirely sure as, you know, what are they supposed to do, are they supposed to do anything more. So uh, that was an important point. Um, Better distinctions of the kinds and levels of engage uh, of engagement, you know, in people who are just interested in the concept versus those who are actively engaged in making some of this happen. Uh, the tensions uh, that might exist through speaking in the context of academic board, Rob, I think that from memory, um, you know, the tensions that exist between those within organisations who actually have influence in making things happen within the local organizations versus people that are you know, kind of doing stuff or just interested. And we'll need to think very, very carefully about that as you know, we move forward with, with these kinds of things if we do have uh, an academic board. Um, we need to demonstrate the real implementation of this, this credit transfer um, because that's going to help shape a, a lot of the conversation. The important point was made, and this was made in the context of you know, an open discussion around sort of academic board stuff. Is there a legislative uh, compliance requirement because different institutions have legislative uh, compliance issues, and we have to make sure that what, anything that we do fits within what is required legally, right? Um, I think David made the point that the academic board is really a toothless tiger, and so there was a lot of discussion around how many teeth a toothless tiger should have. Um, but again, I mean, I think it's important in the context of what it is we're trying to do. Um, we had strong uh, suggestions made about do we actually need an academic board? Uh, is, is this something that the OERU actually needs or, or, or doesn't need? And how, to, uh, how, and how do you fit in a structure like this within the dynamic of existing institutions and the traditions of existing institutions? Uh, it's something we need to think about. Uh, and, and again, the name itself, academic board, might uh, not be well received in all quarters. And, and, and so, you know, that's something that is open to discussion. But I guess the action item, although we didn't uh, directly discuss it, is really taking the discussion forward around, you know, these academic board issues, which I know is in the agenda uh, tomorrow, I believe. So that was kind of uh, my summary. Any members of the group would have a fair and reasonable summary of what discussion was in points on this. The only other thing I might add is that you've got the trade-off between people with influence and no time necessarily to right. actually do things uh, versus people who might be very enthusiastic and have lots of time and energy to put into it but no traction. Yeah. So you, you want to find the right people who've got a bit of both in a way. Yeah. The thought too is uh, we talk about academic board. I mean, part of what that kind of role is, if we take away the board, I mean, uh, all our institutions, the fact that we review those courses that are in a sense an academic, uh, um, not a board, but a, a group that actually do verify the, the quality and academic integrity of the courses. But there are other people, um, sort of, that, as well, I think that, that um, are important to keep connected with. Librarians, 
And then uh, increasingly, uh, the registrars, the registrarial offices, who uh, are involved in processing all these transfers or uh, portfolio assessments and things like that. I don't think we've had much engagement with some of those yet. And those are fairly key people in other institutions. And, and that's, that's an important point. And certainly from the OER Foundation's perspective, we, we need to ensure that <coughs> The right people who need to be involved in the decision making processes are actually on the table when the decisions are made. Yeah, because the danger is that, um, uh, you know, all, all of us who are OER fanatics end up in our own little bubbles and our institutions talking to each other, but forget to make those links to the, um, to the people that are going to be able to uh, implement these projects in our institutions. <coughs> And I believe group four, our technology group, uh, and there are items there. I'm not sure who's reporting. Uh, or do you want me to do it? Well, I think I'm, I didn't quite understand all of it. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was oh. almost fascinating. It really was. It was a really fascinating discussion. We had our own little academic committee on that committee. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the stuff that was not <coughs> controversial, and then we can decide whether or not to go into something where I think attention was expressed. I hope, and I encourage everyone to interrupt at any moment. <laughs> Seriously, because I don't want to misrepresent anyone. Um, so, I mean, the fairly straightforward stuff, I think, actually came out of Gabe's demonstration. It was very clear. And so some of the benefits, I think, for, for partners is we have this incredible resource that we, if we utilize it well, I think partners will be able to reduce costs and efforts and just see what tools are out there because there's this expertise available, not just from the day, but within the network. Um, and you know, open source, is something I've learned for years is when you move from one platform to another, if you adopted a tool that was at least adopting open standards, uh, your pain and avoiding things like vendor lock-in is reduced. Um, so something we see that the OER has already demonstrated is a proof of concept. These are tools that work. You can try it out. Um, and I know for a fact that you can use the OER network to say, hey, that does look interesting. Can I have a test account and see how it works? And if I try it with a few of my colleagues without having to do an installation and all that stuff. So that's all, you know, fairly, I think, straightforward. Um, things we, I think, just from the point of group of the working group, like things we can, we'd like to do is kind of keep thinking of that way. Our tech group is less just a group to implement technologies to deliver courses, but to become, uh, Dave's phrase, a technological nexus where we kind of become more like a network uh, in, in that regard. I hope that's fair. Um, so just, you know, it's the actual thing, strategies, to, it'd be great to have more people being part of that working group. So again, as we said this morning. And um, something that Dave said, so I hope you, I, I capture this correctly, uh, communication strategies so that, for example, with partners, we might be collaborating on side projects between us. Something that Dave can be very helpful with is um, things like tool selection uh, to, meet, to, to, to choose tools so that people don't end up on divergent paths and getting into people selecting mutually exclusive, but selecting tools based on their own criteria and inadvertently selecting tools that are mutually incompatible. So that the, the kind of communication they were hoping to facilitate becomes impossible by virtue of the tools that were selected. Right. And, and by checking ones that, that can work together. So the part that rose uh, what I would describe as tension uh, is in the issue raised. And I was only really able to state it in one sentence right at the very bottom there. So at one point in the conversation, we started talking about the nature of a course being in a wiki type environment for example, or other environments, where course content essentially is a living document. And for those of us that are enthused about that type of um, information model, one of the huge benefits of that is the ease with which someone might adopt that content, recontextualize it, revise it, turning it into something like a living document. Uh, and, and so you might have two or three versions of the same course being delivered by different partners. Now, where this seemed to raise some concerns is if we are attaching a credential to say an approved version of that course and a partner or someone else for that matter takes that open content and creates a revised version of that course, what is the relationship 
of the initial quality assured, assured version to downstream versions. And I would just say a lively conversation ensued. <laughs> and we'll continue. Yeah. And, and I hope that's fair. Yeah. That is very fair. Yeah. I mean, I'm very pleased to see the attention on the table um, because this is the future around education in this space. And we're going to have to tackle it one way or another. And, I mean, I think there are ways that we can do it incrementally. And I think that's part of the value of our method graphing of these solutions. I mean, it needs technical solutions, but those are necessarily good academic solutions. At least it's visible. Yeah, that's right. The current situation in most universities where everybody pretends that what we proved is being taught. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think Rory's going to say what I'm going to say, but say it, Rory. Maybe not. <laughs> it would seem to me this could be a deal breaker. I mean, we cannot have 10 different versions out there and then have, have a challenge for credit exam on that. We have to have one. If, if, if it comes to that where there's all these different versions, I believe what we would do is take our version out and not refer to the OERU at all. We would just put it on to our website. Because uh, we can have seven different exams. I mean, this just is ridiculous. We just cannot possibly work under that. Uh, Cindy, would you? I agree. Hmm? I mean, I can't see how we could work with that. No, no, no. I think that this is a sort of general problem for um, any open resources where you want to demonstrate an efficacy and say, look, we've tested this particular textbook, we've shown that it's all the things, but at the same time, the message is, but well, you can change it, you can do what you want with it as well. Those two things are completely in tension. And um, the idea that you know, you're putting high quality learning resources out there and saying, yeah, but you can change it and do all this other stuff. Is a real problem for the accreditation, I think. Um, so the only way around it, I think, is you're going to say, well, there's our kind of alpha version, which is the official OERU, OERU version, which is sort of recognized by these institutions. Then you're free to change it, but yeah. then you don't get the credit. Yeah, and, I, and I think that's or maybe a five percent change or something. And Rory, you're right. What you said was not what I was thinking. I was going to say. <laughs> but it's all good. Yes. But you're right, Rob. And, and again, this again points to how important it is to have the version control of the wiki because we can then script an exact instance of a course that has been approved because it's really in the assessment and you know the resources can change i mean we can have pedagogical debates about that um but the assessment and then of course in a challenge exam situation you don't want to do a bunch of stuff that's not going to prevent it yeah, I, I just think from a student's point of view, it could get very confusing, yeah. you know, and I think we, you know, if we're, if, if we offer these two courses, tier U courses, and I'm looking at a student coming to me and saying, I've completed all the content, I, I want to challenge this exam, I want, I want to get the credits, we've had an instance of the challenge exam, and we go through a lot, because that challenge exam, as we discussed in our group, is more than just a 30% quiz on, a, on a, as one piece of a full course. It's a challenge exam, so it's 100%. That's the value. Think of that, right? So I need to make sure that that challenge exam is actually testing what they've studied, and what they've discussed, and what they've been exposed to. And if they suddenly come back and say, well, your challenge exam is right way off the mark, because that, that, I was studying stuff about Australia, not Canada. Yeah. And I would say, well, which version of the course did you take? That's going to get really confusing. Absolutely. It's going to undermine yeah. the integrity of our whole. Absolutely. Yeah, so we have yeah. to be careful about that. Yeah. Well, there's integrity, but the other thing we keep talking about is um, permitting the institutions to have the autonomy over their own curriculum and, and what they're willing to accept. Uh, so, so again, there's this tension that if, you, if you're going to create a single version of a course, and then insist that all of us accept it, you will lose some of us. Oh, uh, you know, and um, I, I don't know why you couldn't have both. I, I, I may be disagreeing with you just a bit here, but I know that uh, we offer an introduction to psychology course at my institution. We also accept others' intro to psychology courses uh, for transfer credit. We don't delve too much into how, by what percentage does it differ from our intro to psych course. We simply give it credit. Uh, and, and I don't know um, that uh, it might be nice for us to offer something um, for those who don't have something, or if, or if, we, if we intend this to be some sort of research study where we can compare students across institutions, all of whom 
took the same exact assessments. But uh, otherwise, I, I think. No, 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 that's right. But it highlights an important facet of this discussion, and that is this multiple course discussion only comes into play if there's more than one part of assessing the same course. Right? That's the only time that that's going to occur. Because where we're at at the moment is um, you know, the institution is assessing the course that they've kind of put into the kitty, or it's a CLEP exam, right? So we don't have that challenge. Uh, because the assessment is associated with the institution and put the course into the box, right? But moving down the track, this is something we're going to have to think about and how we manage that. And you're right, we, we don't interfere with institutional autonomy. We don't. Yeah, it's, it's against the nature of the pulpit, right? I mean, yeah. And let me say one more thing about this. I'm sorry, since you've got a clip. Uh, different institutions within the United States award different numbers of credits for the same exact score on a clip exam. It's, up to the institution to make that determination. Absolutely, and, and the students are quite wise in deciding which institutions to get the credit exactly. from. <laughs> <laughs> Another sort of approach to this would be to have something like more like a GitHub kind of version control. For the, so you'd have a particular cores, and then you've got okay, well here's the Athabasca variant that's credited at Athabasca. Here is the twelve percent of the content that's been changed, so you can easily see. Um, and then, you know, here's the Open University's version of it too. Um, it seems to me that's the most sensible way of trying to... Technically doable. Um, but you've got but I don't think it's going to happen with the public. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've got the GitHub version. Okay, yeah. yeah, no, it's just, um, I'm glad that you raised the, the sort of degrees of freedom that we already have in terms of accepting articulated courses. I think within institutions we have a similar thing already in terms of approved official course outlines and multiple instructors, multiple sections that teach roughly the same course or pretty much the same course and often using the same resources uh, in terms of being assigned to students, but a little bit of some degrees of freedom. So I think even though there are these, these tensions that are, that, are, that are in some sense opposing, uh, we can be very explicit about what those degrees of freedom might be. And there are in some cases that I can envision, whether it's sort of uh, looking to the future of um, continual updates or revisions to courses in content areas where there are changes systematically over time, where individual institutions will want to move very quickly on those uh, in terms of updates to methodology or certain findings, for example. And I don't think anyone in, in, in the world would particularly walk at those kinds of changes. But I think we could be rather explicit, and there may be some courses where there are more degrees of freedom than others. But it's a useful discussion to initiate. And that's a good point. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll, we'll be back at, uh, be back at four o'clock uh, for the next session, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, Rob is going to guide us through uh, the current state of research in OER, and I'm looking forward to seeing how we might be able to utilize that for OER in the network. Okay, back, back at four o'clock then. Thank you. Sorry, Dave.